uh, to the Martin Jiski Hall of Biomedical Engineering uh, to the panel discussion as part of the Purdue Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, I'd like to introduce to you our, our moderator today, Professor Chris Roche. Uh, Professor Roche uh, is in the Medicinal Chemistry and Molecular Pharmacology Department uh, and is director of the Purdue Institute for Integrative Neuroscience. Uh, he's a well-recognized uh, expert in protein misassembly and aggregation uh, in neurodegenerative diseases, such as Parkinson's disease. So we're delighted to have Professor Roche uh, moderate and introduce the panel. Please welcome Chris Roche. Thank you, George. All right. Well, uh, thank you, George, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's uh, really an honor to participate on this panel discussion, and really I'm excited about the opportunity to further explore the topics that we've just heard about in this forum. I think the goal here for all of us is for this to be really a fluid discussion. We do have some questions to get us started. We have some questions submitted by the students as well, and so we'd like to make, make time for those. And at the end, we'll certainly allow some time for the audience to ask questions. So uh, just to begin, I'll have the other panel members introduce themselves with just a few lines about your background and expertise as it relates to what we'll be discussing here. So uh, my name is Fang Huang, I'm an assistant professor uh, at the Biomedical Engineering Department. So my lab work on a single molecule imaging, just as you have heard from Dr. Murner, and super resolution microscopy. And we work on the direction of live cell imaging and uh, in tissues and hopefully animals, and then we push on the resolution that we can achieve in 3D. I'm Tamara kinzer Ursum. I'm an associate professor in the Weldon School of Biomedical Engineering here at Purdue. My lab studies um, biomolecule networks, particularly protein signaling networks, where we look at them um, as dynamical systems and try and understand how their spatial localization and and gradient activity um, inform cellular decisions. And particularly, we're uh, looking at synapses and in neurons and studying kind of learning and memory formation. We've already been introduced to Dr. Morner, yeah, so we'll, we'll move on to Garth. All right, I'm Garth Simpson. I'm a professor in chemistry. We build instrumentation uh, using ultrafast optics to probe nonlinear optical interactions as a function of position and time. On, um, on two aspects of super resolution imaging and the kind of talking about panning. So, we've got two aspects of super resolution. One relates to uh, fluorescence imaging as an extension of a way we found to image FRET parameters in vivo, but instead of using the point spread function of a microscope, we can think about a transport problem and at a point uh, measurement, the Green's function. Uh, and the coherent aspect of super resolution is. Um, when there's a structured illumination and spatially varying field, you can think about the object moving in that background or the field mo moving in relation to the object. And this encodes far field information in a way to extract um, super resolution information in a way that is fully yet to be explored. <laughs> Hopefully, at least. All right, thank you, everyone. So I, I think we have a sense that there are people of interest from the fundamental perspective and applications. And so I'll ask the first question just to get us going, Dr. Morner, of your journey is really fascinating, what you've you shown us. I think you did a tremendous job illustrating your, your path. And I think one question that uh, many of us have is how aware were you of the magnitude of what you were doing? If you look back, do the various steps make sense? Were they logical? Did you realize that at the time? Or how much of it was serendipity? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Uh, it turns out that the steps that we were taking, that I was taking, uh, make some sense, if you like. That's not me making all that noise. I apologize. Um, they make some sense in the, in the sense of the way my life was going. That uh, with, with starting out as an electrical engineer and then learning about physics and, and mathematics and chemistry and biology and so on, I mean, the uh, time at IBM was a time that uh, sort of asking deep questions that were fundamental questions was, was the most important thing. So let's put it this way. When we knew that it was going to be exciting to detect a single molecule, because no one had done it. So it's like a, you know, uh, a, a tough experiment, right? A, uh, or something like that, that you could say, well, we did something tough or something. But that, that's, of course, not impact, right? And the, uh, the impact that occurred, we could not envision. 
Remember we started at a low temperature, or you might say fairly esoteric, it required high resolution and uh, uh, lasers and so forth, uh, <coughs> liquid helium, superfluid helium. Uh, but by opening a door, what, what, what is so exciting is that the, the scientific world, the scientific community, everybody thinking about that, new people doing experiments, those stimulating us, we, our work stimulating other people, There's, that all happens and, and it's a bubbling thing that keeps going forward. It, it wasn't clear at the beginning that blinking would have an application, for example, and yet it does later. So this is really the way science works. You have to be uh, excited about science every day. You have to be excited about what you're doing now. You have to enjoy it all along the way because, uh, you know, impact it may or may not occur, but you, the best thing is to be happy, which is to enjoy it every day. So uh, I was following this latter rule, okay, not saying, okay, we're going to do something, we're going to, we're going to get a Nobel Prize someday, so we're going to do only something that will give us a Nobel Prize. That's just not the way to do it. I guess another question that many of us have is then, what is the next big thing? What's going to lead to the next revolution from your perspective? Or what are some barriers that you see right now that must be overcome? You see, uh, that's another good example. People would like to know, what, have me tell them what, what's the next great thing that they should do. So <laughs> I, I, I've done my best by telling you things that we've just finished and have just submitted, right? Uh, the, the, the current challenges, of course, are to always learn more, Al always extract more information, always extract uh, more useful variables, try, try to figure out ways to measure more properties uh, of the system. And, and it, we're choosing to do it with single molecules. Not everybody uses single molecules, but just because they're this sort of elemental, um, smallest unit, I, I still think it's a very valuable and fruitful area to explore because there's more to learn from that regime. Uh, and, and, then, and putting it a different way, there's uh, thousands and thousands of, of, of experiments that contribute to a whole text on cell biology. And we've only reproduced a few of them so far with the super resolution of single molecules. We should reproduce all of them. We should reproduce all of them. Good try to fix your AV here. This is uh, I'm causing a problem? I think it's coming in and out. But um, can you hear me? So, yeah, I don't can think you hear me now? Working. One, two, three, four, five, six. I mean, uh, the people that are local can hear my voice anyway in a room like this. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we don't need all these microphones, and if it works okay for the distance, fine. So, anyway, I, th I think that's um, uh, a, a major frontier uh, in my mind. Uh, work that needs to be done is on fluorophores. We need better switchable fluorophores. We need fluorophores where you have more control of, over whether they're on or off. Um, th it turns out they're, they all behave with Poisson statistics, which is not the best when you have an exponential distribution. You'd like to actually have a narrower distribution for uh, when you want to change a molecule, for example. Uh, you have lots of uh, uh, needs for different wavelengths. We have needs for better fluorophores at 77 Kelvin that can be switched on and switched off. So, you know, most of these things are, are, are incremental. Uh, more photons, better precision, applying in more systems, and so forth. That's not really a revolution, but some of those things may lead to an observation which then does produce a revolution. That's where the revolutions come from, just doing great science, good science, fundamental science. Not predictable. Okay, let's, pa let's have you just pass the bike. That one's the one that works. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> well, since I don't have the mic, I'll go ahead and ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah, he's, he's the moderator. No, I think I, I was hoping the other panel <laughs> participants would chime in at this point. Yes. Okay. So I'm, I'm really curious how you made this initial transition from doing um, yeah, uh, spectral hole burning measurements on defects in crystals to single molecule detection, and then since then, how you've managed to not only understand the physics uh, uh, and, and, uh, and the mathematics behind it, but also the biology and the implications of the biochemistry associated with these discoveries. Uh, so you see, the, all of these uh, transitions uh, occur uh, because uh, I'm always trying to think about what's interesting, what's exciting to do, what's the next thing to do, how can I have more impact, if you like. So uh, low temperature was uh, high resolution, as you said, and, and in fact, high resolution is 
really beautiful. You know, when you can uh, see many, many, many features just by scanning the wavelength of a laser and all sorts of beautiful things, it's, they're very sensitive to the local environment, all kinds of things. And it was hard for me to, to leave that regime. But remember, at IBM, I couldn't do the biology. And so but leaving IBM opened up the possibility to, to uh, apply to biological systems. And because single molecules innately sense heterogeneity, OK, if you measure single, 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 I felt it would be much better to shift to the broader biological regime uh, and give up on the super high resolution, uh, which is very, very difficult to do. But you can see what happened. So because of the breadth of applications and the breadth of systems that can be studied and the problems that are present you know, at, at room temperature, uh, that turned out to be a fruitful step. So it, it's just a matter of at certain times in your life, you have to make a choice. You have to decide uh, where do you want to go next. And basically, re remember that all the things that you've learned, this is to the students, uh, of course. You, you learn many things, and you stop doing one thing and then do another thing, and so on and so on. And, and don't be upset about that, because all of those things you did before, you might use later. So you know, think of it as a, a process of continually learning new things. And that's, any, anyway, what my life is all about. I'm continuously a student. Uh, so learning the biology was another challenge. You have to be comfortable a, a bit with uh, being a beginner in, you know, in a new area and bone up on things quite a lot and so on. So um, it, it, it's, a, it's challenging, let's put it this way, and, uh, but I encourage challenges, right? Challenges are actually better for you than doing something that's boring. <laughs> I had to smile during Mr. Mourner's comments because I, I think that um, my personal opinion is fundamental understanding and pursuit of interesting directions with passion is really important and why I was particularly uh, smiling is, is that there's a gentleman at the end of the end of the row here who helped me um, understand some or well, start to understand some things about the brain and and that took um, quite a lot of patience to encourage me to enter the field of neuroscience a few years ago um, I uh, so I was also thinking about the sort of the fundamental what people learn, how they think about problems, whether it's interpreting an experiment or thinking about basic math and physics and how you sort of consolidate and, and understanding and, and knowledge as, as opposed to just information and you build upon that. I have a technical question, but maybe I should <laughs> wait on. Go ahead, I think, please. So. Super resolution comes from adding information that you know about the experiment, the point spread function, or the fact that you have something blinking. So ultimately, at the end of the day, it's a signal to noise question. How many photons, or how patient you are, or how stable things are. So there are a lot of practical limits. Um, mm -hmm. Then you have fluorophores that are introduced, targeted, um, and they blink, and you see them to high resolution, um, so you know where they are, at least at certain instances in time, and you, um, but the information that you can extract about the underlying questions relates to where they are and what they're doing and, and, and are they interfering with the system. They're reporters on something that maybe you care about as an underlying mechanism. So every, opposite, every measurement interferes to some degree. It, it, you have to shine photons on something to see. So uh, there's a question of Extraction of information, underlying principles, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So maybe I mentioned two things about A, it's, a, it's ultimately a, a difficulty question then, in terms of precision, signal to noise, how many photons, and B, about what you actually learn about the underlying problems um, and, and the strategies for that. Uh, yeah, so I think you want me to comment. Sorry, oh. Sorry take this back. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> yes. So th th those are they're very uh, useful points. Uh, one of them that you uh, have uh, mentioned a bit here is this issue of uh, attaching a fluorescent label or something like that and the, ef the effect of attaching a fluorescent label. So uh, one, uh, there, there are a couple of things to think about when you, when you uh, think of that particular issue. First of all, it's a f always a fair question to ask whether you're perturbing the system. I mean, it's absolutely essential that we don't just measure something that's, that's an artifact or something like that. Uh, 
luckily, let's talk about green fluorescent protein for a moment, it would not have revolutionized biology if it perturbed systems terribly. Okay, so the Nobel Prize in for green fluorescent protein to Roger Chen and uh, his colleagues and so on in the field uh, are, are resting on the fact that there, that's not that great of a perturbation to add that protein uh, for, in, in for the most part. Um, but I'm not going to say it's always true that there's no perturbation. Uh, but but it, if you think about it from the point of view of uh, something that uh, engineers study very well, uh, we're working at low Reynolds number. We're working in, in these situations where uh, the fact that you add that mass that doesn't matter as much, okay? Uh, because it's not ballistic motion. It's not ballistic transport. It's diffusive motion, okay? So that has, has mean square displacement growing linearly with time. Uh, and so there aren't velocities and so on in the sense that you normally think about where you might worry about that kind of perturbation. Um, the, uh, the other uh, aspect that um, uh, comes to mind when you think about these issues so the, the comment I just made relates to whether the motion is, is perturbed a lot by having to drag a floor for around with it. Well, if it's a green fluorescent protein, that's of course a lot bigger than a single one nanometer label. And so whenever we can get to the single one nanometer labels, that's obviously better. You get more photons and it's less perturbative for sure. Uh, but anyway, uh, there's such ease in doing fluorescent protein labeling that people still continue to do it uh, a lot because it's so quick and easy to, to get that kind of labeling. And I want to say that now we know that for certain structures, that fluorescent protein label does perturb the super resolution structure in certain cases. If you, uh, for example, overexpress uh, GFP fused to uh, a protein called CRES, uh, which is a crescentin like analog protein in, uh, in Colobacter responsible for its crescent like shape, uh, that protein is supposed to just be. Uh, in a, in a crescent line across uh, along the edge of the cell, but when it's fluorescently labeled, it, it can detach and form a helix, which is not the normal shape. And so we know that. And, and we, uh, uh, the best thing to do is to test a structure with several different labels of different sizes to make sure there isn't perturbation. So I guess what I want to say is because we're, we have super resolution now, we have to be even more careful because now we're going to possibly begin to see cases where there is some perturbation, right? But nevertheless, um, uh, remember that there's other objects that one can study. A natively fluorescent protein, the, the antenna proteins uh, common in, in, in photosynthesis and so on. You don't have to add any external label. We study those a lot, even in solution. Uh, they have fascinating photodynamics. So uh, it's a great question. You always want to know if there's a perturbation and you have to do controls and, and you really have to do controls if it's anything biological. Um, and sometimes physical scientists are, are not so aware of, of that particular aspect. But uh, it is only by great controls that biology made progress based on two by two correlation matrices, plus minus, plus minus. Only by doing a lot of controls was that able <laughs> to, to make sense. Sorry for the long answer. <laughs> well, and I would riff off of um, what you were saying earlier about switching fields. Um, and the way you can switch fields is either you learn it yourself or you bring in collaborators that are really good in that field. Yeah. Um, and you know what struck me about looking at some of your work is your, your collaborations with Lucy Shapiro on the Colobacter and the work with the glycocalyx with Carolyn Vitozzi. And that's um, allowing you to look at the glycocalyx without fluorescent link labeling it with genetic proteins and using some of these bioorthogonal chemistries that are coming in from chemical biology, so again, kind of crossing fields and allowing you to put labels on um, the outer matrix of the glycocalyx without using these really large um, genetically encoded proteins, and that's another switch in, in fields, and um, that it, I think that technology in particular has a lot of um, interesting applications moving forward. So you're absolutely right. I, I wanted to mention it earlier, but again, I was, my answer was already too long. The, the, uh, uh, importance of collaborators t for me was really essential for this changing field business because uh, uh, the, the, the stance we take is that we're expert on the physical measurement, the optics, the single molecules, localizations, and all that stuff, the optics. Uh, but I like to collaborate with good, good uh, experts on the other side who bring all of those uh, other uh, knowledge and skills and background to the problem. But it's, it's super important to recognize what makes a great collaboration. Uh, a great collaboration is where there's, there's mutual interchange of ideas. 
and you learn about the other person's problems, and they learn about your problems, and you know uh, both and work together uh, on a solution. So it, what works, what does not work, is throwing something over, over the fence, I call it. You, you know, oh well, we're the people that do one thing, and so we make a measurement, we throw it over the fence, the people on the other side do their thing and throw it back over the fence. That, that's not a collaboration, so I've been blessed with many great collaborators, like you mentioned several. Uh, and others, Peter Jackson, an experiment looking at the inversing compartment of the cilium, you know, Tim Stearns uh, working on other structures in the cilium and the centriole, and so forth and so forth. So th there's been uh, uh, an, an, a wonderful uh, flowering, and I think that's a great way to learn new fields. So if I could pick up on that a little bit. Uh, I think that. Uh, what you're saying really resonates with many of us here. We're really focused in the life sciences institutes, including the neuroscience institute in which I'm involved with trying to spur collaborations between life scientists and engineers. And uh, Kevin actually alluded to it earlier. Sometimes it's challenging. We speak different languages, but I think um, essentially all of us involved in these collaborations find that they're really enriching ex experiences. Uh, I'm wondering what you think, though, in terms of how that influences training. You know, I think many of us think that we provide different opportunities to our students as a result of having these collaborations, but uh, we have to think carefully about what is the most productive experience for students in, in those settings. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you've had similar yeah. thoughts with, with your collaborations, venturing into different fields from your immediate field initially. Yeah, it's, it's a great question, and it's worth, worth thinking about. Uh, I still believe it's essential to become expert in a particular area. I mean, when you're, let's say, getting a PhD, you certainly want to be expert in that area. Uh, y you don't want to just be jumping around and never getting the depth to, to be able to uh, execute something deep and complicated. But um, the fact that there's these collaborations often uh, certainly gives opportunities for uh, cross-fertilization and learning of the type I just mentioned in terms of learning the other side of the story. So quite often my collaborations with, with biologists have involved one of my students working with one of their students, or my postdoc working with their postdoc together and so on. And so they, that um, uh, certainly gives both sides uh, a more powerful knowledge set for, for the way we should move into the future. Uh, you, you need to be working and understand what's going on at the boundaries of fields to, to make progress. I just, I want to chip in a little bit. I'm still learning this, but I, we did exactly what uh, uh, W has mentioned before, throwing fences, right? This is the initial errors that when we're trying to do collaboration, we thought we could collect data and the biologist going to interpret the data. But in fact, that this doesn't work so well and we have hard experience on that. So what we feel these days is if we want to train a student to work on a collaborative project, instead of getting a student to go to individual meetings, we set up collaboration meetings and then we have to review the progress at least every two weeks and discuss and what's the, what's the bottleneck. And then hopefully a range of people can sit in the meetings. I feel at least when we start from there, and there's a lot of involvement and ideas, and as a P PI, I also learn a lot during those meetings. Maybe I can just <coughs> ask one more question from a technical point of view. So you, you mentioned your BGNet, right? This is a fantastic demonstration of how deep learning can be useful. And the background, patent background that you mentioned before, it has been always there, right? In super resolution imaging that we see single molecules, there's always background. The background never is constant. They are always patent. But nobody solved that problem previously. So first question is why people didn't even a attack that problem. The second question might be maybe what do you think you know, deep learning can go further with, uh, for example, optical imaging and uh, a super resolution in general. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, those, those are great questions. Um, first of all, in terms of uh, background, um, there's, you're, you're absolutely right that many researchers have used just a constant background uh, in their fitting. 
But there are some researchers who have uh, pushed this one step further and used uh, particular kinds of ways to estimate the background. Uh, an example is uh, the rolling ball uh, estimation of background. So this basically means you, you have this lumpy image that has a bunch of molecules in it, but you roll a ball underneath the image, and you know whenever it touches the, the uh, signal, then you call that the background. And uh, that actually works, but only for low spatial frequencies. It only works for a certain small range of spatial frequencies. So, so what my point is that there are some people who have tried to do things and, and done, done useful things. Um, another example of that might be, you know, my single molecules are very sharp points, and so I take a uh, Fourier transform and I look for, as the high frequency information is where my molecules are and the low frequency information is everything else, and so remove that and then inverse Fourier transform and then fit, so forth. Those kinds of tricks have, have been utilized. Um, and uh, so why has nobody tried to attack it it's in this fundamental or sort of broad way? Well, I don't know what to say about that. I mean, uh, Lanhardt is, is a brilliant guy, okay? So he uh, has decided he wanted to learn a lot about neural nets and uh, taught himself. Um, uh, we're seeing it affect our world in many ways. Uh, so it's not such a bad idea to learn something about it. Uh, and uh, there have been uh, several other uh, neural net applications he's come up with. We've, we're using it for phase retrieval, we're using it for some fitting, other people are using it for multi-emitter problems and so on. It, um, if, if it's stated as a, as a clear uh, problem that can be solved, you know, by managing, using this as a way to refine weights in a, in a very high dimensional space, uh, then that's not so bad. It, it sort of lets us uh, solve maybe a problem that's harder to do from pure fundamental points of view. I don't know. I think it'll keep going and have more applications, but we, we always have to look at them closely. Can I, can I ask a, a follow-up on that? So the, in, uh, in super-resolution methods, you are detecting the fluorophore. And when you start labeling uh, to, uh, and, and your labeling density therefore dictates the resolution of the structure you can obtain. If, in other words, you can only see the, uh, uh, something, a structure if it has fluorophores dotted all along it. And at some point, as we increase the resolution, the, the labeling density starts to be the limiting factor. Could do neural networks, for example, create opportunities for filling those gaps in super-resolution imaging? Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the latter part of your question is, is not so clear. I mean, maybe, I would say probably. But <laughs> uh, more specifically, um, this, this issue uh, um, says, okay, we're, we're, we're doing labeling, we're measuring positions of molecules, but uh, if you don't have sufficient density of labeling, as you said, you cannot claim high resolution. And for that reason, uh, some people in the field have defined new measures of, of resolution, uh, not just the localization precisions or something like that, but a combination of localization precision and the density of, of localizations that you find. It's so-called Fourier ring correlation. Uh, it's a different measure that includes this effect, okay? So you're, ri you're right that if you want to get higher and higher and higher and higher resolution, you do need denser and denser labels. Then they'll start interacting with one another, and that'll be an ultimate limit. That'll be a problem that has to be, you know, dealt with, right? Um, whether neural nets can solve it is, or get around some of these issues of density and so on is, uh, is not clear, but I think there's already some, some progress in this area. I mean, some people have... Uh, just recently published some papers that say, well, if I only get sparse localizations, I can figure out what the structure is. But they already know what the structure is, okay? So that worked where they knew what the structure is supposed to be. And if they only sampled it poorly, then they can figure out where the rest of it is, okay? But you can see where that came from. Uh, it's from the, the, the prior knowledge of, of the shape. So, uh, you know, there's lots of interesting challenges, I would say. <laughs> and, and that's one of them. So yeah, I'd like to cover some of the questions that were submitted by the graduate students, because these are good questions I think will be interesting for all of us here. So one question is that a number of studies in the field of uh, super resolution microscopy have focused on single cells, bacteria, or mammalian cell culture. And so the question is, what challenges do you see in moving to tissue level studies? Uh, so, and tissues, of course, uh, there's a number of issues. Uh, certainly one of the big challenges is that they're a lot thicker, and you have potential for out-of-focus background. 
So it's very important to have use some imaging method that rejects out of focus background. You, you could say that might be light sheet, but you also could say let's use something like STED, stimulated emission depletion microscopy, which has a confocal sectioning capability. We actually use STED in looking at tissues right now in my lab. Uh, it's a super resolution technique invented by uh, Stefan Hell. It, it's uh, great, but very complicated compared to single molecules. But nevertheless, it does have some Z-sectioning. So we use it on tissues. Um, the uh, uh, going very, very deep in tissues and so on, you know, gets into lots more complicated and, and fascinating optical problems, you know, scattering and, and all kinds of other things. And there's a lot of smart people in the engineering community trying to figure out what to do about that kind of, of uh, loss of information if the photons scatter a lot on the way out. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm excited to learn what's going to happen in that area. Uh, but anyway, in general, you, you can use it on, on larger structures. You, um, of course, want to be able to look at a, a large area in, in order to find the area of interest uh, because, you know, you're always looking at a very small region when you're doing super resolution, yet you, where the region that you care about is somewhere else uh, far away from that. And you have to be able to scan everything before you uh, zero in and things like that. But uh, I, don't, I don't see a fundamental reason except for these issues, right? Depth, how do you deal with depth sufficiently? How do you deal with scattering? How do you deal with out-of-focus background? And uh, th those are challenges. So an another question, uh, again, on the application side relates to uh, how do you imagine the evolution of technologies, uh, advances in the area of super resolution? with electron microscopy. I think you gave a good sense of those two working hand in hand in your talk, but uh, so, so what do you foresee in the future as far as those, those two approaches? Yeah, well, um, the, um, you know, advances in uh, electron microscopy right now are, are really staggering. They're, they're really amazing. Uh, just by improving detectors and, and uh, using some very simple phase mask, actually. Uh, a Zernike plate, zone plate, uh, they've been able to improve their resolution trem tremendously. But in the, in the um, uh, broader cell context, you don't get the same resolution as you get when you're trying to look only at one protein and, and average together hundreds of thousands of copies of that one protein. So there's, there's limits, and there's uh, a limit on thickness of samples. So people know that, and so they're already uh, using FIB milling and so on to, to slice samples and, and get a bunch of thin sections. They require thin sections. You damage the sample with electrons when you get sufficiently high resolution. And you have to trade off, again, all, all these uh, advantages and disadvantages. Um, I'm sure that some people in that field uh, think that they're going to ultimately have so much resolution, you know, just imagine improving it by another factor of 10 or a factor of 100. Who knows how? I mean, you're not changing the wavelength very much. You, your detectors are already spectacular. Anyway, let's suppose they did a ten, ten, factor of 10 or 100. Then they will see the shape of every protein, okay? And, and they don't need fluorescence maybe, okay? But uh, that's not true now, so uh, for now, you know, uh, remember that uh, there's a value in watching individuals and seeing how they change with time and seeing how they are in live systems and seeing how they fluctuate and seeing how they might behave differently and you sort of miss that when everything is, is frozen. So, advantages and disadvantages. Exciting. Another question. I would, yeah. oh, sorry. I, would, I just wanted to make a few more comments on that. So um, in terms of thinking about super resolution, um, uh, just to dive a little bit more deeply on two things that you mentioned really quickly is that um, in cryo EM, you're going to run into superposition problems, um, and that's what we're seeing. Uh, we're doing some cryo EM. Um, um, I see my postdoc Scott in the <laughs> audience. Um, if you're even if you're looking at a at a single protein, um, and you cannot tell what its 3D structure is if you're looking uh, through a 2D plane, um, and you need a, a large amount of prior information about what the structure is that you're looking for, um, especially when you're looking at cells then, um, and you mentioned this in your talk, is um, you're going to need a lot of um, information about what you're looking for, and it's very static. So that would be the third point, is you cannot get dynamic information from cryo-electron 
tomography or microscopy. And these are areas where super resolution microscopy and the interface between the two are going to be very exciting, I think. All right, another question, switching gears a little bit. Uh, so we talked a little bit about your mentoring method, but this is an interesting question, particularly with uh, all the fascinating advances in your lab. So do you discuss with your graduate students which parts of the project they can take when they graduate? How do you make those decisions? <laughs> there seems to be a lot at stake there. <laughs> uh, well, you know, uh, absolutely we discuss that <laughs> when, when the students leave. Uh, for the most part, there's uh, n so many new ideas out there, so many interesting things to do that people, uh, that this is, is seldom a problem. Uh, or putting it a different way, uh, when, when people uh, in my lab uh, accomplish something, publish and write it up and so forth, it's, it's usually pretty exciting and kind of important if possible. Not every paper is, is super exciting, of course, but the, they tend to want to do something different. They tend to want to uh, use everything as tools and switch to another area. So it's really very seldom uh, a big issue. Um, in, the, in the case of, of tools, of course, uh, in general, uh, everybody can use the tool. You, you publish the tool and everybody in the world is going to use it. Certainly I'll use it if I want to. Um, and that makes only common sense. So I, I, it generally works out without any, any big difficulty. So one more question here, and then we'll open it up to the audience. This is another interesting question, a bit on the lighter side. Can you tell us your favorite and least favorite part about the Nobel Prize ceremony? <laughs> 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 yeah, you know, these questions are always, you know, like, what's your, what's your favorite element? So I was asked, what's your favorite element? Uh, at one point, and you know, I was like, "What?" <laughs> so, <laughs> but that was at a conference, uh, um, the Mendeleev meeting, uh, the 150th anniversary of the periodic table, and so on. So, <laughs> you know, um, the, uh, the the favorite part uh, about this uh, whole activity, I guess, I would have to say, uh, was the um, pleasure of bringing uh, my family, uh, colleagues, and uh, friends. Uh, to Stockholm and having a very special dinner of our own, uh, separate from all of the hubbub uh, that, that we, and we took them to. And, and that was a, a great moment because it combined not only family, but uh, mentors and coll colleagues and collaborators and so on in different parts of the, of the whole activity. Um, the, the, uh, the activity is, is pretty crazy. Uh, the, the whole uh, week, uh, the whole Nobel week is it's completely amazing, uh, and there's long stories uh, that I'm happy to tell about it if anybody wants to listen. There's also a book about it that you can read. One of the laureates wrote a nice book of having Reindeer with King Gustav is the name of the book. Uh, Reindeer with King Gustav, it's a, the wife of, of uh, Bob Laughlin wrote that one. <laughs> has a lot of the correct details if somebody's interested in it. Uh, but uh, the uh, perhaps the least favorite uh, was uh, some the, the surprises that occur when people uh, just contact you because they're trying to uh, take advantage of you. Uh, and so I'm being very honest here, this actually happens. There's people who, who want to um, uh, somehow profit um, by, by asking the laureate to do something. Um, you know, um, I was asked to give uh, come to an event and give talk and so forth, but it turns out that this was a, a uh, stage for some person to sell a bunch of things and make a bunch of money and then charge people a lot of money for, for coming and talking to the laureate, for example. Uh, and, you know, um, things like that are not so much fun um, when, you, when you recognize that every, in some sense there are a bunch of people out to make a buck um, out of it. So, you, for example, there's people uh, in Stockholm so, you know, after uh, getting out of the car, usually, the car u is a fancy black car that has a, a nice limousine with a special driver and our special uh, attache run, you know, going around with us, all wonderful. But when you get out, quite often, there's a couple of people standing there and they have a, they have a portfolio and they whip out a huge picture of me. And they say, please sign this. And I'm going, oh, okay, that's interesting. Okay, I guess I can sign this. So I sign the first one. Then, then we go to the next place, the same two guys are there. Same two guys pull out another picture, one another second year. So on and so on. 
So these are on sale at eBay, okay, for uh, Nobel laureates signed, uh, signed pictures. And so <laughs> you're always wondering, right, what's somebody going to do with my signature? Or what are they? <laughs> so that's, that's not, not the nicest part. I think uh, in retrospect, I guess it's not surprising. But um, I'll add one other question, if I will. What is your favorite element? <laughs> <laughs> Since you opened the door, we have. I think everyone wants to know. <laughs> you don't have to answer. So, what I, so, but I had originally I had to answer this uh, very with no no notice, <laughs> and so you know, uh, uh, I said Bismarck. That's because uh, in graduate school uh, we were working on far infrared spectroscopy, far infrared detection, far infrared sources, far infrared line shapes, all kinds of stuff, and uh, well, one of my projects was to try to take bismuth, which is a fascinating semi-metal, and turn it into a light source for, uh, for far infrared, you know, sending currents to it, whatever, doing sort of business at two, two degrees Kelvin, so on. So anyway, bismuth is what I said. Oh. Sorry, you want the mic. Great answer. <laughs> um, all right. She's all Sorry. about the bismuth. Sorry, she wanted oh. to hear about bismuth. <laughs> okay, so I think at, at this point it would be great to open it up to the audience. Do we have microphones or do we need to give you? Yeah. Anybody have any questions? So with super resolution microscopy, what do you see as applications that will translate to the practice of medicine? So uh, in, in the case of medicine, you know, you, you care uh, a lot about disease, and, uh, but it's worth remembering that uh, an understanding of disease is based on knowing what normal behavior is as well as diseased behavior. So all of these techniques apply to both. That is, we can learn more about cell biology when it's normal, and we can learn more about cell biology when it's abnormal. So uh, the example from my talk was the Huntington aggregates and these uh, structures and cells that come from that kind of disease. But there's many other, uh, you know, uh, manifestations of disease that come from cell biology. Um, and so uh, the, the real regime where this matters is because you can see things better, you can also ask what is, uh, and at a mechanistic level, what is a particular treatment doing? What is it actually changing, okay? So that's all about super resolution. But in backing up to single molecules, single molecules are being used, of course, in sequencing now uh, in uh, the uh, um, PacBio and so on. Other companies are using fluorescence from individual molecules to sequence DNA. Uh, very long reads come from the PacBio implementation and so on. So there's a lot of connections because it comes from, at the core, cell biology, understanding it both in, in uh, diseased and normal situations. This, this happens, there's many, many examples. Drugs can be labeled, you can see what a drug does, where is it going, how does it get into the cell, all kinds of things like that. Thanks for the she great talk. She's got more examples. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know that I have an example, but I would have a, a cautionary tale. Um, just to think about what happens um, in medicine or in, in drug discovery when we rush ahead to develop drugs and put drugs out in the market when we don't understand the fundamental cellular mechanisms. You know, and we'll take the, the neuroscience, for example, as, a, as a, a case where we have now pushed into phase two, phase three clinical trials, multiple um, Alzheimer's disorder therapeutics, and they have all failed. It's because we still do not understand the fundamental mechanism behind the disorder. So, you know, if we look at fundamentals, um, and put our energies in understanding that basic science, ultimately we would be more successful in developing therapeutics and treatments for disease. So right. just absolutely need more of that. Yep. It's back to fundamentals. Okay. Uh, thanks for a great talk. And uh, I have a question about the neural network. Just like by the neural network, we can go beyond the optical limit and get some hidden information from the image. But how do we tell the the information we got is fair or some artifact from the neural network processing? Yeah, that's a great, great question. Absolutely and very, very important. So the, um, the best answer that I have is you must validate. You have to validate many, many times. You have, it's the equivalent of doing controls. 
you have to do enough tests on known systems and see that it behaves correctly on known systems to be able to trust it on systems that you may not know everything about. And so that's the, that's the, the basic answer to, to that problem. Um, and, and that's why we train, with, with, uh, train sufficiently so that you get the right answers back uh, most of the time. Not all of the time. There will be a few cases where there's a, a few estimations, let's say, of the background that's, that are incorrect. Um, so it, it only comes from having this statistical weight of showing that in many, many, many cases, hopefully sampling the space very deeply, you, you uh, see that it behaves correctly. Uh, I have a question. Uh, what is your dynamic in your lab w w with you and your postdoc and your uh, PhD students? For example, if your PhD or postdoc encounter a problem, uh, do they always come to you to find the solutions where you let them to solve the problem alone? And uh, if your postdoc have a good idea, would that idea come from you where they actually think about their, create a, their own project? Well, I would say that um, all of these things occur uh, in different, different degrees to different people, okay? Um, but in general, uh, I'd like to be interactive with the lab. Uh, my office is in the basement with the laboratories, not with a window to the outside. Um, it is because I want to be close to the research. Uh, when, when a problem comes up, sometimes they don't ask me, and they try to solve it themselves, and they sometimes do, which of course is fantastic, which is great. But there are some times when there's a problem that they haven't solved, and I actually can solve it very quickly because I've seen it before. So they s learn over time that they it's, it actually is not a bad idea to ask me whether I know how to solve this problem. Okay. Uh, so in any case, it, it is important for, uh, it very important for grad students and postdocs to solve problems on their own. But when there's a tough thing, I like to be involved so that I'm always asking for that. Uh, if there's a new idea for a new project, um, uh, and I find it exciting, and our, our funding structure can support it, then I'll be happy to uh, you know, encourage that somebody to follow that. Um, so uh, uh, the um, tilted light sheet idea was, was my idea, actually. But uh, other people and implemented it, made it work, showed it, fixed it. That is, there are always going to be details that require things to be adjusted and made to work better and so on and so on. So it's really a still a team effort in the end. So some ideas uh, come from me and, and a lot come from the students. It's a mixture. Uh, and uh, I'd mentioned, by the way, that you know, whether funding will allow it. So unfortunately, this is a kind of a, a bit of a a fact of life in our world. We have agencies that uh, we ask for money, and then we have to give reports, and then we have to get refunded, and we have to have the money to keep the lab going. So it's very important to, to actually deliver on some of the things we said we were going to do. Otherwise, you don't get funded. And uh, I've had grants turned down just like everybody else. So it, um, it is important to also think of the funding structure. Sorry, but that's the way it is. So it seems that structured background noise can be difficult to analyze for neural networks. I was curious, what steps can be taken to reduce the incidence of these like, figures? Well, I mean, I showed a system that actually extracts structured background. It estimates it quite well, so that's easy to remove. Uh, but, but you can also experimentally try to reduce it. Uh, for example, uh, it's always essential in any of these experiments to have the cleanest possible situation, to remove any impurities, fluorescent impurities that might be causing background. Uh, uh, for a long time at the very beginning, we, we grew cells and phenol red media. Uh, this is just thrown in, but it's not essential. It's just to show you the color of the media. And that actually produces fluorescence. So you start growing without phenol red. So you, you, you lower your background fluorescence. But, but native, uh, native autofluorescence from the cell is hard to get rid of. And it, it can be something that can cause difficulties. So uh, you can move to longer wavelengths to move away from the, the background fluorescence that's from autofluorescence. That's why we do a lot of imaging in the red uh, or yellow to red or whatever, because you move away from autofluorescence. Trying to do these experiments in the blue is extremely difficult. And almost no one does it uh, because of extreme background from everything that starts lighting up. right? And then the you can also use maybe time domain. Uh, you could, if you were clever, you could might figure out a way to throw away background because it maybe has a different time structure uh, than, the, than the emission that you care about. 
This is a, t a technique called uh, photon uh, burst detection and uh, so on. So um, there, there's, there's ways to think about it, but nevertheless, you know, sometimes you can't get rid of it easily and uh, having a, a mathematical way to remove it is, is very convenient. Thank you so much. Uh, I believe from your talk, you already showed, like, from the single molecule, like, uh, um, perspective, the technology or the method here is very kind of fully, de not fully developed, but well developed. But in some of the cases, for example, in the, like, uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease and some, like, uh, cancer biology, people are more interested to um, understand the protein protein interactions, since that kind of dominates some of the, like, fundamental mechanisms behind the diseases. Do you think how far we are, or what are the challenges we're facing right now, moving from uh, single molecule imaging to like two bodies or even three bodies observations using super microscopy, super resolutions? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, so we, we do a number of protein-protein uh, interaction studies that involve m using multiple colors, uh, placing different objects at different colors, and then you can watch them simultaneously. Um, and FRET as another technique, uh, energy transfer, it works on a very short spatial scale. Uh, Two-color co-localization works uh, f for intermediate scales and so on. So there al we already have techniques from the single molecule community for looking at protein-protein associations. However, one of the challenges is if you'd like to do that at the single molecule level, then you need both of those to be at low concentration. Uh, you need uh, uh, and if you take two objects and dilute them both to a, a nanomolar, then they have very, very low probability of interaction. So one strategy that people have been using to get around that is to use these uh, controllable floor force ideas. If you leave most of them off but only turn on a few very close to the one you're interested in, uh, or have one be in high concentration but only sparsely labeled. And so those techniques allow you to um, observe protein-protein associations. I mean, you know, unfortunately your question opens up, it's a great question, opens up a lot of interesting, uh, you know, things to think about. Uh, another way to measure protein-protein associations uh, is to use our uh, thing that we call the ABLE trap, this device that uh, looks at uh, individual proteins in solution. Uh, and what you can do is the, the trap analyzes everything about the trapped object, not just its fluorescence and its, let's say, its excited state lifetime and all of that, but also the behavior of its motion, how it jiggles around in solution in the trap, which is information about its size and its charge. And so I if you can measure the uh, chi size and charge of the trapped object, then you can have other partners that are coming in that are unlabeled, but when, when you form a, a dimer, the behavior of the motion changes. You form a tetramer, the motion changes, and so on. And we, we applied this recently to an oligomeric system. So it's not so different from these uh, uh, amyloid disease kind of problems. If you would like to know more precisely what's the distribution of, of oligomers, uh, you can do that uh, by sensing something about the object when its partners are around, okay? So I think there's a number of ways to look at protein-protein kind of interactions. Uh, some based on diffusion, some based on fret, optical kind of tricks, and so on. And there's, there's more ideas that people have out there for this sort of thing. Yeah, so I think the question was, was not, we couldn't quite hear it, so he's very interested in knowing what, uh, what criteria or what I think about when I'm selecting graduate students or postdocs for the lab. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, so um, first of all, I mean, I, I look for uh, achievement uh, that in, in their prior work that they're, they're an expert in a certain area, have learned a lot. But I'm also interested in people that, who are inquisitive who are uh, ready to ask questions, ready to uh, think about what kind of things have not been done yet. I'm interested in people that have done things with their hands. Uh, this, is a, this is actually a tough one now because there's not that many people you know, building stuff with their hands. But I try to find out, can I uh, figure out if they're good with their hands? Do they repair their bicycle? Do they uh, uh, do something that builds something so that you, because we're really experimentalists. 
we're, we have tables filled with optics and components and so forth that all have to be adjusted. And uh, so th that's another key thing that, that I need. But in, in general, you know, uh, it's all these things together plus their background. Does it fit in at a given time? Does it fit in with our funding? So on. All of those things. Hi, Dr. Moore. Uh, so I would like to ask a question about um, how exactly do you deal with the heterogeneity that you encountered uh, during cell experiment? Because uh, for the there has been a lot of effort being pushing the temporary and uh, spatial resolution, but with such a small field of view. So it takes a lot of effort to be able to collect a lot of uh, images from different cells. And uh, usually those cells have a uh, it's an intrinsic heterogeneity with it. So I would like to know what's your insight about balancing the uh, uh, resolution and also uh, more information about the uh, population. Yeah. So it's, it's a great question. Um, one answer, th uh, this is a little bit of a flip answer. Biology is tough. Okay. <laughs> Biology is complicated. And uh, so, un but more, more seriously, you know, if, if, the cells are so heterogeneous that we cannot see any consistent behavior, then we're just doing the wrong experiment and we have to do something else. We, you have to have some behavior that's, that's repetitive, that the cells have to generally behave, you know, the same. And so your, your, your question is sort of how do you, you know, it takes time to do all this. Well, you can, you can program all that, right? I mean, uh, w one of my postdocs decided to, you know, do a big survey of the whole field, you know, make some quickie measurement of all the cells, record where all of them are. Then you just tell the computer, go to the first one, do the measurement, go, do the, go to the next one, do the measurement, go to the next one, do the measurement. Students at home are doing whatever, data's being taken, you know. Uh, uh, and so we, we, we fight it because you, you definitely do have to observe many single molecules, at one at a time, and, and you know, look for consistent behaviors. So it's, it's, it is one of the uh, aspects that sometimes is hard uh, uh, for some people to, to get comfortable with, but it's, it's, a, it's sort of a fact, uh, a fact of doing life, a fact of life. And we, uh, we don't have control of every variable, so that's, that's, the, that's the challenge. You're right. Okay. Wow, this has been really terrific. Time has flown by, and uh, unfortunately, I need to bring the discussion to a close. I think we could have all gone on much longer. This was really excellent. Uh, so I'd like to thank my fellow panelists here, of course, and thank the audience. Really terrific questions. It was great for everyone to be so engaged. And that lastly, I'd sense. like you to join me in thanking Dr. Morner for really giving us a memorable, stimulating experience here. Thank you. Thank you.